Good afternoon, and thank you very much for allowing the time today to join us for the Civil Designer version 8.3 online launch. My name is Charles Scott, your host, and I'll soon be joined by a number of colleagues who will be demonstrating a long list of highlighted Civil Designer features and functions included in version 8.3. Right now, you should see our blue Civil Designer Software welcome screen, as well as the go to webinar floating toolbar. Please use this toolbar to send us any questions you may have during the various presentations, and please feel free to download any of the Civil Designer Software Showcase PDF articles. As per usual, we will be posting a copy of today's webinar on our Civil Designer Software YouTube page for your later reference. Before we begin, I would like to hand over to Vincent Bester the CEO of the Civil Designer Software Group, for a welcome message. Vincent? Good afternoon, everyone. 30 years ago, we set out to develop a new breed of design software for civil engineers. Software that was easy to use and yet capable of handling complex projects. Software that would allow engineers to get on with their design with a minimum of fuss in order to increase their productivity and throughput. In 1998, we realized that it just didn't make sense to work with six different design programs with the concomitant errors introduced by data transfers and by trying to keep six different data sets in sync. And so we created Civil Designer, the next generation and the only truly integrated civil engineering infrastructure design platform. I am very proud to say that Civil Designer version 8.3 continues in this tradition as we extend the functionality to allow you to work faster and smarter. Some would say it is brilliantly simple, others that it is simply brilliant. I hope that you will enjoy seeing what we have put together today take you to the next level. Thank you, Vincent. We're now going to begin with a demonstration of the highlighted functionality included in Civil Designer version 8.3. First off will be Cameron Boyle, who will be covering the roads module. Cameron? Hi, everyone. Civil Designer 8.3 has many new functions. I'm excited to be able to show you some of them. I'm going to start off with this acute angle junction design. In Civil Designer 8.2, you had a minor limitation on the acute angle of the intersecting road into the main road. In 8.3, we've crunched the algorithm and you no longer have that limitation. Crossing the road Using the new roads rehabilitation functionality, I'm going to widen the existing main roads width and I'm going to use that additional width in order to design an off ramp from the main road onto the interchange. I'll then show you how to put in road barriers using our linear road furniture functionality. I'll show you how you go about using the report quantities function that is unique to Civil Designer 8.3. Then further down the highway, using the new profile viewer, I'll insert a road culvert crossing, which I'll insert on the tow point here, check my cover, and then also check that I don't clash with the existing services. Finally, I'll end off with the new point-to-point -point site distance function, where if you are positioned here, are you able to see the other side of the interchange due to the earthworks being in the way? If you're not sure, stay tuned for more. I'm going to use my roads control panel. It's quite easy just to go and right click and select show road. I've also gone and defined my zoom views. In Civil Designer 8.2, you had some minor limitations on the acute angle of a junction design. You no longer have that limitation in 8.3. You still go to junctions, add junction, indicating your intersecting road, indicating your main road. Specify your left curve radius, right curve radius. Did you know that if you've got a center island, you could simply pick it up from CAD? In this case, I don't have an island. Click on OK a couple of times. 
selecting your view axis, you can then go and specify what view you would like seen. In Civil Designer 8.2, we showed you that you are able to go and put in road signs and road markings. I've done that beforehand. Using my layer groups, I'm going to go and turn on the road markings for my junction. Reverting back to my top view. I'm not going to use the road rehabilitation function. I'm going to start the road next to the existing main road. And I'm going to design the, the new road as an off-ramp onto the interchange. If you have the center line in CAD, you can use the regression function. But I want to go into more detail with my design. So first of all, I'm going to go to File and select a road file. Go and specify which road to use. I've gone and created a template that doesn't have right hand side information because what's going to happen is this new road is going to be next to the existing main road. I choose not to select a design criteria for this road. Starting my road design, I'm then going to insert my first PI. And using my keyboard shortcuts, I'm going to change my views. When I put in my PIs, I have the option to select Start Stake Line Extraction from CAD. Remember this function when I do the Edit Horizontal Alignment functionality. Insert my next PI. Put in my NPI. So looking at my alignment as it is, I'm going to insert my last PI. I'll put it in as PI2. The reason why I'm doing this is because I want to show you a new function in 8.3. If I go to alignment, horizontal, graphical move along the back tangent. I can then click on PI2 and move the back tangent. You'll see the front tangent stays the same. And then move PI2. I can go and use my toolbar icons. Did you know you can change your PI radius and your properties? Enter. Go to my alignment and check my horizontal alignment. Select extract strings on the bottom. By default, Civil Designer will go and put in your stake line, which currently has no additional information. Do you remember when I put in the first PI, I had the option to extract from CAD? This is the option I have over here. If I do go and select it, it means that Civil Designer will give me the option to extract information from another entity from my start to my PI1. Let's go and close that. Look what happens to my control center. You can see that the stake line has additional information stating that I can work from the start to the PI1 point. Let's take a closer look at that. If you recall, the start of our road was right next to the main road. Here's PI1. So we have a gap between the main road and PI1. We then pick up the stake line or the horizontal alignment from our main road. We do so by selecting this icon 
specifying road entities only. Click on the road entity you want to pick up. In this case, I'm clicking on the existing main road. Civil Designer picks up that the road is segment 1, A13. It gives me the options to go select any string associated with that road. I'm going to use the left road edge. I then right click, extract string. Can you see it's highlighted it in red? If I click on the red text, on my plan view it highlights what I've just selected. If I'm happy with it, I can then go and right click and recalculate road. As you can see, the gap's been closed. If we go and view this in a cross section, I could click on the road, right click, road operations, and select cross section. Click the position of the cross section. If I go to my display settings, on the bottom right hand side, you'll see we've now included a strings model option. So you go and specify your color. And on your cross section, you can see we've got the existing main road as well as the cross section that has been colored according to my road pen settings under my option settings. Pressing page down on my keyboard, I can see that the horizontal alignment is perfectly aligned. However, my vertical alignment needs to be designed. In order to do this, let's go and turn on contours. And in 8.3, you'll see we give you an additional option to display for carriageways only. Looking at the contours, you can see that they aren't aligned just yet. Let's move this out the way. And let's look at the vertical alignment. Again, I select my road. Looking at the cross in my plan view, I'd like to keep the main road's vertical alignment until about chainage 430. So I can then go and right click and insert a PI. Alternatively, I'm going to my spreadsheet and inserting my PI. I mentioned 430. And then I'm putting in a rounded off level of 30. Just so that you can see how it changes at a later stage. Look at your current vertical alignment information. And then I'm going to go and switch on Extract from CAD. That is pretty much the same option you had with the horizontal alignment. Look what happens to your control center. There it's picked up from chain edge 0 to chain edge 430. Same thing as before, I go and select the icon, specify my road entities. Civil Designer has picked up my chainage range. I'm picking up from the road entities. Zoom in to the existing main road, left click, specify what string of the main road I want to work with. right click extract you can see it's red if i click on it it highlights it for me right click and recalculate road if you look at your new contours you can see that they're perfectly aligned going back to the complete the vertical alignment I previously specified a level of 30. You can see it's been updated. If I were to go to the graphical view, Civil Designer indicates the grade from where I extracted. I do have the option then to go and edit the PI point. 
due to my cut and fill, I'm going to drop the PI and give it a curve length. Completing the vertical alignment design. Let's close that. Let's take a look at the cross section. So there you can see the horizontal and the vertical alignment has been designed accordingly. And from change for 30, the road starts to split. So it may be a good idea to change your off ramps template at that stage. Turning off my contours. Let's put in a junction onto the interchange. Once again, I go to junctions, add junction, specify which roads I'm working with. Put in my left curve radius, right curve radius, check that my other perimeters are correct, and then I have the option to save or load for the next time. The reason why I'm doing this is because I want to change the width of my new road, and I want you to see that the junction gets updated. Let's graphically change the width of my new road using the new function in 8.3. I now go to Alignment, Edge Levels, Insert Edge Width Point. Civil Designer opens up the Edge Control Panel for me. I can then check what grades I have and what the existing widths look like. Reading my prompt, I indicate the position, enter or left click. You can see a new change has been inserted into the edge control spreadsheet and the new width. Let's put in another one. In a similar manner, I can also go and delete these new points or move them. Looking at my spreadsheet, I'm going to continue with the last width. Let's go and close that. Because my road expert is switched on, Civil Designer will redesign for me. If I go back to the junction design, you can see that the width has been dynamically updated. Using the signage functionality, you are able to go and add your road markings. I've done that beforehand. And then go to my CAD layers and switch them on. Looking at this section of road, I find that I need additional width. I can pick up that width from existing CAD lines. Beforehand, I've drawn in this blue spline, and using that, I'm going back to a function I pointed out earlier, the regression function. But this time I'm going to extract strings and then pick up the left edge and I'm going to specify to use my CAD entities. When we do this, we want to retain the existing cross fall of my new road. Select the line, right click and extract string. And I want to put in some guardrails using the new linear road furniture function. If you go back to signage, you'll see we've now added an additional function there, add linear road furniture. But before we use it, we need to go to tools and go and select linear road furniture editor. 
Here you would go and create your own furniture. You could then go and save it and load it at a later stage. Let's go and add our own. I'm then going to go and specify where to pick up the drawing entities used for the panel in the post. So I select my browse button and open. If I now go and click on these down arrows, you'll see what options are available to me. Using my mouse wheel, I can see what options are available. Looking at my preview, I can see that my beam rail needs to be made higher. So I'll go and specify an elevation and offset. Let's go and save it. Before I insert it, I need to go and specify where I would like it positioned. You can go and do this via any polyline or spline, or you could use a road display line. Let me show you that. If I go back to my display settings, go and specify road layout. I'm working with Demo Street. And then I'm going to switch on, let's call it a construction line, half a meter to the right of my existing road edge. Click on OK. And there it is. So using that as a reference, I can then go and put in my rail. Changing my view axis so that you can see it better. I then simply go to signage, add linear road furniture. If I choose the standard mode, it would then apply the furniture along the full length of my road display line. In this case, I want to use the start and end point where I go and specify where that is. We designed the furniture called Demo Rail, and the distance between my posts will be 1.6. If I choose to use the fine gap point, Civil Designer will measure distances that I go and specify. In this case, I choose not to use it. Click on the green tick, specify which line I'm working with, and then go and specify my start point. As I move my cursor, you can see then that it follows my cursor. Right click and quit. I then go to switch off the red line. And let's go and view this in 3D. Using my defined zoom views, this is where we had the cute angle junction design. You can see the new textures implemented in 8.3. If you want to switch them on, you simply right click. Go to Render Settings and specify Enable Textures. On the left hand side, this is where I went and designed the additional width using the Road Rehabilitation function. Then again, on top of the off ramp, you can see what the new rails look like. Let's take a look at the new report quantities functionality. In Civil Designer 8.2, you went to area volume and you specified the mass hall volume. You can still do that in 8.3. However, in 8.3, you also have the option to view your quantities in a database format. And this is unique to Civil Designer 8.3. If I go to Report Quantities, 
On the left, you'll see all the roads listed in my project. And by default, we give you the option of combined. And that would be the quantities of all the roads in total. Segment one being our main road has layer works left and right because it's a dual carriageway. If I had components, the quantities I listed in the components tool editor would then be listed over here. Same applies to my curbs and my junctions. If I want an update on my areas, I could simply go and right click, select recalculate. Once you've recalculated, you'll see that I've got a green tick and on the bottom right hand side of my dialog, I've got a timestamp of when this calculation was done. Once you've got your latest results, you can then right click and write a CSV file. Alternatively, you could go and select the results to output option like you did in 8.2. You can go and customize which roads you would like displayed. Let me remove all of them. And then I'll select the main road and I'll select our demo street. You can see now those are the two roads selected. We also give you the option to go and add a customized report. And on the bottom here, you can go and specify which roads you'd like. Not only that, but you can also go and customize what you would like displayed for a certain road. As an example, if I want just my areas and layer works, I would then go and switch off the other categories. And I also have a change range. If you want to work on different segments of your road, you could then select an existing road and we'll give you then the option to go and right click and rename it. Let's go up the highway and using the new profile viewer, I'll insert a road culvert crossing. If you haven't seen the new profile viewer yet, let me show it to you. I'm then go to my terrain mode and I go and specify quick profile viewer. I'm working with the existing ground surface. If I choose to use the strings model, it will then also show me the roads profile. Using my contours as an indication, I'm then put in the start and end point. Right click and finish. As I move my cursor on the profile, you can see the position on your plan view. If you're looking for particular elevations, you can go and click on a point and your elevation is specified. At the bottom, you can go and customize what is displayed. Going back to my roads mode, I go to tools and use the existing services function. I go and specify a start point and an end point. If I select to add the skew section to the road, Civil Designer will automatically snip the culverts at the tow points. The actual cover is continuously calculated. If you were to go and change your height, your cover level would be updated. You have the option of specifying a CAD layer. Let's go and extract the invert levels. We work in with the existing ground surface. And because I want you to be able to see the bottom of the culverts, I'm then going to go and put in a vertical offset of 0 0.15. 
So my culverts are actually going to be higher than my ground level, knowing that my road is in a full condition. I've still got sufficient cover in this case. If I go to my display settings, I have the option to switch on crossings and specify which crossing you would like. Going to my display settings, I'm going to switch off my other services and I'm only going to activate my culvert. At the bottom, I can go and specify if I want additional information and which settings to use. If you'd like to see if there's any clashes between this new culvert and the existing stormwater line, I simply go to my stormwater module, go to tools and select clashes. Clashes between my stormwater and my culvert with one meter clearance in this case. There are no clashes, but if I were to, for instance, make that three meters, click on check, and there I get an indication of my clashes. I could then go and right click and show clash, or I could go and view it in a long section. Let's go and view this in a 3D format. Using my defined zoom views, there's my start of the culvert. Looking on the other side, moving on to the last function, I'm going to show you the point to point sight distance. If you recall, we wanted to know that if we stop at this traffic light, are we able to see the other side of the interchange given the earthworks in front of us? Looking in the plan view. I go back to my roads mode, select alignment, point to point sight distance. Go and specify what settings I'd like, make a permanent CAD layer of it, specify visible pen, invisible pen, and what line style to use. If I stop at the traffic light where my cursor is, I left click. Now, as I'm moving my cursor, you can see if I've got green text with the distance, then I'm able to see the position of my cursor. However, when it turns red, the position of my cursor is intersecting with the ground. Let's try that again. Let's start from this side. let's move it to the the line is still green so I'm able to see the position of my cursor looking at it in a 3d format you can see where the red site intersects your ground and the green site you can see the position of where my cursor was Hope you enjoyed watching. Until next time, cheers for now. Thank you very much, Cameron. That was fantastic. Next up is Andrew Cole, who will be covering the new functionality included in the Design Center, Survey Terrain, and CAD Pro modules. Andrew? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be showing you a few of the new Design Center and Survey and Terrain module enhancements that will be available in 8.3. The first new function that I want to show you today is the image cropping function, which allows you to snip out a portion of an image and save this as a totally separate image file with the associated positioning world file. To show you this new function, I'm using this height pair image, which is similar to the one that we use for the survey and terrain training, but this particular image has a much higher resolution. I'm going to draw a rectangle to show you how the add custom clip to image has worked up to now. 
we generally select your image, right click and add custom clip to image. And then select the polyline or ellipse that define the portion of your image that you wanted to display, as you can see on the screen. The only problem was then you still had the whole full image working in the background. So I'm just going to undo and undo those changes to show you the new cropped image functionality. So I'm going to zoom into this area via my redraw area. I click to select the image and then right click and select the saved cropped image option. I then get prompted for the upper left hand corner and then the bottom right hand corner. Okay and then I need to name and save this new image file to a folder. I'll just call it soccer field. Save. And then you get confirmation that the image file and the world file have been created. I can now load this new image file into my project. So insert image. And I select the soccer field and the image is tiled and loaded. And thanks to that positioning world file, the image is inserted exactly in the correct position. You can just have a look at these roads to see how neatly it ties in. Okay, so I'm relatively happy with that um, positioning. I can now um, zoom into that area of the image and then I can actually delete the large image file which is still selected and then just focus in on this um, portion that I need to work with. Okay, and then I just want to show you in File Explorer how the image file size has been reduced. The new Soccer Field JPEG is about 10 megs um, compared to the initial file that I used that is about 1500 megabytes. And then note the positioning file, the JGW, um, with the correct insert coordinates and those pixel distances. So it's the same pixel um, size as the original image, so you don't lose any um, picture quality. So quite a nice new feature. Okay, moving on to this next new terrain module function that you guys are really going to appreciate. We now have this new remove invalid lines function, which will automatically check for and remove any invalid or crossing lines in your DTM surface. This is going to save you a lot of time when trying to validate your model. To show you how this function works, I have a project with a terrain surface that was created by translating some roads along with their intersections to a DTM surface. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'm going to run the validate model function. So model validate model to check for any errors in the triangulation. And just select the surface. Okay. So no parameter could be found. Okay, as you can see, the validate has picked up some errors. If I zoom in, you can actually see there are some crossing lines in this area. All right, so now I'm going to run this new remove invalid lines function and that should sort out those crossing lines. So it's model remove invalid lines, the surface and then you can see the CPU working on multiple cores and then at the bottom here you'll see that we removed four crossing lines. Okay, and then we just run the model validate model again just to make sure that everything's okay. And always a nice message to get is that line model scans successfully. Our developers have done a lot of work on the terrain strings recently. And next up, I would like to show you some of the major improvements that have been implemented for 8.3. A large part of the terrain strings development has been to make one terrain string see another terrain string. In other words, there's no need to translate to a DTM surface and merge surfaces to tie into an existing string platform. 
Okay, to show you how this works, I have one string platform and I'm going to design another string platform right next to it. So string from polyline. I'm going to call this one middle. And I'm assigning a fixed height of 252. Okay, delete the CAD. Okay, and then I want to create the child on the outside. So select the string, click on the outside, and I'm grading to a surface, which is my surface one. And then I'm including the strings model in this grading, in the toe line grading. Okay. Okay, then I just want to switch in the properties. I'm going to switch on the banks so we can see. And then just clear selection. Okay, and then I'm just going to do a render view. Uh, right click render view just to show you how that toe line now has been draped along the DTM and then also along the existing or the previous string. So we can see how neatly that is picked up. Um, on that first string bank. Okay, with my third platform, I'm going to show you how you can drape a terrain string on a DTM surface as well as on an existing terrain string. So I'm going to use strings, string creation, and string from polyline again. I'm selecting the polyline. I'm just going to name this one bottom of the three platforms and I'm interpolating on a surface, surface one, draping intermediate points and then I'm using the strings model for interpolation. Okay, I can delete that CAD. Okay, and then just to show you the result, I'm just going to go to the render view again and you can see how neatly the string has been draped on the DTM surface um, and for the most part and then in this section it's draped on the second or middle terrain platform string. Okay, so that worked just perfectly. Okay, and then I wanted to um, switch the visibility of this third string off. So I'm opening the control center. I'm just going to pin it open. Okay, and you'll see at the bottom there's a new strings tab, which I'm opening up, and then you can see you can switch the visibility of your strings on and off from the control center. I'm also going to the roads, and I'm activating this road that I've designed. I'm going to use this road just to show you that you can actually pick up um, or interpolate from a road um, design as well. Your strings can also interpolate from the road design. So you'll see at the moment our platform middle platform hasn't picked up the toe line as yet from the road design. So to illustrate how it works, I'm just going to rehight the string. So editing rehight string, and I'm selecting that toe line string, and I'm telling the program just to include the strings model in that grading. Just clear selection and then if I render again we can have another look. We can zoom in and just see now that it's actually reheighted it. Okay so and it's picked up the road design tidy nicely on the road bank. So picking up on existing strings and on road um, designs as well, string roads. Okay, and then I just wanted to show you, there's also a new function, this quick profile viewer, which allows you to extract a, a long section. In this case, we're using the strings model, but it's going to pick up the DTM surface, the road cross section, and the string um, as well. You can see that quick profile. It's picked up the road. It's picked up that intersection with the bank on the road, and then our platform.
Okay, next up in Civil Designer 8.2, we introduced the grade point from another function which was very well received. This function allows you to add new points or edit existing points on a DTM surface, and these points are heighted based on their distance and slope from an existing point. In 8.3, we've made some improvements to this function. You now have the choice of specifying the slope as a ratio slope or as a percentage. The original function used a default radial method where all points were heighted relative to the original reference point, but we've now added a chained option where the latest inserted or modified point becomes the new reference point. Furthermore, you also have the option of adding break or feature lines to your design as you add new points. For those of you that haven't seen this function yet, I'm just going to quickly add a few points and edit a few. Okay, so I have to snap on my reference point, which is this bottom right hand corner point. And I'm using a 1 in 50 slope. And based on that slope and the distance, it's calculated the elevation for me. Okay, so I'm just going to insert a few more points just perpendicular to the zeros down the mid block. And you can see as I'm adding these um, new points, the feature line in red is also being added all along the bottom. Okay, and then I'm just going to run grade from an existing point. And in this case I'm going to change the ratio slope to 1 in 20 and I don't need to add a break line or feature line to add this new point up here in the corner. Okay. And then I also need to change this first zero elevation in the mid block so I'm going to run that grade point again to edit existing in this case, and I'm using the radial option. So I'm editing this existing elevation. Okay, and then lastly, I'm just going to reheight all those mid block points. So relative to that reference point, 1 in 50 slope, and it's the chained option. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly reheight all of these down the middle. It's a very useful function if you weren't aware of it as yet. And then the last um, survey and terrain enhancement that I'd like to show you today is that we can now display bank lines on multiple surfaces. The project that I'm using has eight separate um, housing terraces, each designed as a separate terrain surface. Okay, so to show the bank lines, I need to go to display settings. Okay. And then select the bank settings. And to check the box to display your terrain bank lines. And then you've got this new drop down over here, which I can drag the dialog a little bit bigger. You can see all your terrain surface listed. And I just have to activate number seven and number eight for those housing terraces. And then voila, you can see the bank lines showing on all those eight separate terrain surfaces. I'll just show you in the render view how that looks. And isn't that fantastic? I've got two pre-saved views that I can just show you. And that'll be all I have time for today. Cheers. Thank you, Andrew. Our final presenter today is Christopher Smith, who will be covering our pipe modules, which include our sewer module, stormwater module, and water module. Christopher? Thanks, Charles. Welcome, everybody, to the new version of Civil Designer 8.3 Stormwater. In this section, we'll look at the new Greenfield runoff estimation, 
which is now included in Civil Designer. For this demonstration, I'm going to have the projection settings set to the system of OSGB. Within the Greenfields runoff estimation, Civil Designer will cover both the IH124 and the FEH methods. The user can change between any of the methods during any stage of the design to recalculate and regenerate the reports. In this video, we'll cover the FEH method. When populating the data, the user can choose between doing this manually or automatically, finding and retrieving the required data. We'll populate the data automatically. Right away, Civil Designer will load up the map and navigate to the location in the world based on our DTM survey information within the project. An internet connection is required to load the physical map, which serves only as a visual to see the location from which the data can be retrieved from the database. The map is blue, which indicates that the area is inside a predefined polygon region, which is used to automate the calculations. In this example, we'll move the location point to a new location. This will show that Civil Designer will store the new location, which will be used in the Greenfields demonstration and later on in the video generating a storm shapefile from the same location. Now that we've accepted this location, we are informed that there are three closest weather stations. We can select one of the three or the weighted average of the three. Weighted being based on the distance from each station, making a closer station's data more influential. While this data is only for the FEH, this dialog will show even when you're using the IH124, allowing you to change between the two methods at any stage of the design as stated earlier. Civil Designer can now retrieve the hydrological region, the standard average annual rainfall, the host classes being the hydrology of the soil type, and the BIF being the base flow index per host for the location of the project. The 1, 30 and 100 year runoff rates per hectare and the Greenfields runoff rate are automatically calculated using the retrieved data and the user entered data such as areas. We can now compare the difference in results using the two methods. Choose the method and click on the next button. Calculating the attenuation storage required. In this section of the wizard, we will automate the required attenuation storage. All the grayed out items are values directly calculated from the previously acquired graph or were set in the previous page. Here you can see the development area shown as 10 hectares and the M560 rainfall shown as 20 and the M60 minute to the M5 two day have all been set in the previous page. The climate change factor is adjustable. This can be changed based on which guidelines or authority the user is adhering to. The FEH rainfall factors, which are the scale factors to adjust the output values, are pulled from the map. The storage volumes step-for-step -step results are shown, with the final estimated attenuation storage in meters cubed is shown for the 1, 30 and 100 year return events. Calculating the long-term storage required, most of the data has been populated from the previous pages. You'll note the proportion of paved area draining to the network alpha is currently hard set to 1. This is required by all the formulas. However, this can be made editable by checking the set alpha as editable. The proportion of pervious area draining to the network beta and the runoff factor for contributing paved areas RF are both user-defined values. As shown here, the results for the long-term storage volume is expressed in cubic meters per hectare. Calculating the treatment storage required. The last window will be for the treatment storage volume required. There are no inputs required by the designer, as all the required inputs have already been input on earlier sections of this wizard. The results for the long-term storage volume in cubic meters per hectare are shown here in the center of the dialog. Print out of the report. We'll print to PDF and review the results. Here you can see all the input and calculated data presented in the PDF ready to be added to your design report. We'll now quickly look at the new additions added to the storm control panel. When working with the Greenfields runoff calculation, method IH124, 
also known as the FRS, the creation of the storm shape file has become easier. Click on the Browse button, Civil Designer will load up the map at the previously chosen location or the center of the project if it has not yet been opened within the project drawing before. Click OK and load the storm data into the storm control panel. Civil Designer will now retrieve the hydrological region, the annual rainfall, the host class, the BFI host for the location of the project. We'll now look at the soak away design. The soak away design holds a number of variables for the design to be correct. First, you need to calculate the infiltration rate and the ratio, which are fixed variables. Infiltration rate. If the soil infiltration rate is already known, set the calculation mode to manual and enter the value at the bottom of the dialog. If the soil infiltration rates are unknown, input the trial dimensions first, then input in or right click and import the values from CSV into the trial pit spreadsheet on the left hand side of the dialog. Civil Designer will now take the difference between the time to empty at 25 and 75 percent. From that the longest outflow time which results in the slowest draining trial pit will be used. Looking at the ratio, Civil Designer can again choose between the manual and the automatic mode. Should the automatic be chosen, a map will be displayed at the mean location of the project. We'll now accept this location. The easting, northing and country name have been extracted out of the map database and into your project. The calculation requires a ratio of 60 minute to 2 day rainfall of the 10 year return period. In order to obtain the M5D values are scaled using the growth factor to translate them to the required M10D values for the rain event. The ratio and growth factor value is determined from the selected location on the map. Variables to calculate. Populate the remaining outstanding required information. See this as a checklist for the outstanding information required. And set the variables to calculate, which can be any of the following, the upstream area, for the soak away to cater for, the free volume due to the backfill percentage, the internal diameter of a concrete ring, the effective storage depth, or the length and width of the soak away. Once the variable to calculate has been selected, a civil designer will gray out the item below. Now we'll look at the given area's rainfall duration period from the five minutes to 12 hour. The stormwater retention required for those periods are calculated. The peak required storage is reached at the center of the storm duration. From that, the required width is calculated and the time to drain that water out of the soakway is calculated from the calculated widths. The maximum width and the time is then found and placed in the outputs above. In this example, the width of the soakaway needs to be at least 1.3 meters. If we change the calculation to runoff area and we keep the width at 1 meter, then the soakaway will cater for 77 square meters of the catchment area. As an experiment, we'll change the upstream area to be determined. We'll set the width to 1.3 and notice that the area calculated is 100 square meters. The print output. We will print to PDF and review the results. Here you can see that all the data, both the input and calculated, are presented in the PDF, ready to be added to your design report. In this section, we'll be looking at the new visuals of Suwon Storm. We'll also be looking at the new infrastructure available to these modules. You're no longer required to have the 3D checked on in the display settings for the render mode to show the 3D entities. From version 8.3, all the entities viewed in the plan view will be the 2D schematic form, and all the entities in the render view will be shown as 3D entities. Here, you can see that the 2D schematic entities of the Suan Storm, and when I right click and select render view, you can see that the Suan Storm entities are now shown as 3D elements. We'll look at creating better looking infrastructure a little bit later in this demonstration. I'll now turn on the 3D view 
Within the display settings, you can now view the 3D entities within the 2D plane. Sewer and Storm now have the ability to schematically display different pen color, line type and scale to each pipe type that is assigned to that entity. We'll now set up the pipe type 100D to have a different display pen color. Now within our model, we will change a few pipe types to be the 100D. I will do this using a new feature that allows for changing of attributes to links and nodes to be done within the properties bar. In the case of links, a custom name, pipe class, bedding class and fixed diameter can be changed. And in the case of nodes, a custom name, node type, angle, manhole condition can be changed. With regards to node angles, this is no longer a global setting. This is great in the case of curb inlets and headwalls. I will now select a few pipes in the model and go through to the properties bar. I will change the selected pipes to be the type 100D. I will also change the diameter. Just as a note to the new users, the diameter zero allows for auto sizing based on the analyze capacity requirements. I will also change the selected pipes to bedding class B. Now, when we review the pipes in plan, you can see that the pipe schematic color has updated to match that of the display settings. We'll now look at the sewer and storm infrastructure display settings. If you are used to looking for the older version of this under the default settings, you'll notice that it has now moved. At the top, you will select the type of node you wish to edit. I'll choose to edit the 1200 round type. I will also choose to enable auto sizing, which we'll cover in a bit. You can set the 2D schematic visual on the left hand side and the render visual, including the lid type, if you require, on the right. I can change this manhole to be round or square. Auto sizing a manhole is based on where the biggest link coming in or going out of the node fits within a range set up here in the auto sizing manhole tab. These ranges are custom editable to the user's requirements. Additional notes can be added to your nodes. The program is giving us a warning that we need to run the analysis for the new infrastructure types to take effect and be displayed. Once again, we'll use the new feature of changing attributes to the model within the properties bar. This time I'll select everything and I'll use the property bar as a filter. I will use the drop down menu and choose the sewer nodes. And then I will change the node type to be the 1200 round. Looking in the render view, you'll notice that the manholes have not updated. This is due to the analysis not being run. I'll quickly run the analysis and I'll turn off the natural ground shading. This is so that we can view the manhole lids. You can also see that the pipes have been trimmed up to the inside wall of the manhole structure. Let's go over the stormwater. Here you can see that I have turned the dynamic road contours on. I've also turned on the road flat spot and low spot graphical warnings. I'll quickly create a catch pit. I'll give it a name. I'll choose rectangular as the shape. I'll choose the curb inlet as the lid type. I will also choose the symbol as a square shape for the 2D schematic plan view. I will enable auto sizing and review the default sizing ranges in the auto sizing tab. You can also place additional notes should you wish to do so. The program is giving us a warning that we need to run the analysis for the new infrastructure types to take effect and be displayed. 
I'll click on a node that I wish to update. Earlier we changed the node type in the properties. This time I will change the attributes in the node data dialog. This is up to you. Perhaps it's easier to use the properties bar when you have window selected a few of the nodes to change. I will now run the cover levels to update the lid elevations from the road strings model instead of the ground survey. This feature will still use the ground levels for lids that are outside of the road strings footprint. I will now run the analysis for the new infrastructure types to take effect and be displayed. I'll now use the auto align feature found in the properties bar to align my catch bit to the roadway. I will also move the structure closer to the road. You can now see the catch bit in render view. After running my quantities analysis, you can see the different manhole types and their depth categories. You can also run a clash detection between the sewer and the storm from 8.3. This will include the manhole structure that has been assigned as a node type. To generate the construction drawing layouts, we'll run the plot routine. We will select the plan sheet file and ensure that the dynamic layout instead of separate CAD drawings is to be produced. This allows for changes to the model to update the layouts. I will check on for the sewer and storm setting table to be included in the layout. This will also be dynamically linked to the 3D model. We'll now cover the new features in the water module. The pump performance curves can now be implemented as cubic splines up to eight points instead of the three point parabolas. The new pump catalog was compiled using the spline pump curves. Some pump types like the Grunfoots, CR, CRI and CRN and the KSB Movitech have been included for the first time. These pumps, due to the wavy performance curve, could not be accurately represented in the old catalog. The pump catalog can now be filtered on pump type, supplier, range, model, and optionally required duty point. The new pump curve editing window allows for immediate visual confirmation of values entered into the data table on the pump curve graph. The air and scar valve spreadsheet, which shows all the air and scar valves at one place. The valves can now be sorted by routes. Valves can be edited. Valves can now have a custom ID name. That brings me to the end of all the new features of sewer, stormwater and water. Back to you, Charles. Thank you, Christopher. That was fantastic. Another year, another version, and Civil Designer continues to grow from strength to strength. Christopher, Andrew, Cameron, thank you for your fantastic contribution to today's webinar. I think it's very important to note that these gentlemen never left Civil Designer once through all three presentations. Everything they did today was performed with inside the Civil Designer software suite. To dive in your developmental team, thank you once again for a great version. And most importantly, thank you to our technical partners and clients for your continued contribution to the future growth of Civil Designer. Civil Designer version 8.3 will be released next Friday. An email with a download link will be sent to everyone who registered for today's webinar. Once again, thank you very much for your time. Take care and goodbye.